Hello, my name is Barb Farrell. I'm a pharmacist working in the Geriatric Day Hospital at Briere Continuing Care in Ottawa, Canada, and one of the leads of the Deprescribing Guidelines Program of Research at the Briere Research Institute. In my clinical practice, I see many older people taking multiple medications that are sometimes no longer needed or causing more harm than benefit. While medications are started because they're intended to control symptoms, prevent or slow the progression of a disease, not all of them are always needed lifelong. Medical conditions may change as people age, and the same medication that worked well before may not be the best one anymore. Drugs may also cause more harm with time. Older people are at more risk for harm because they respond to and handle drugs differently. They can be more sensitive to side effects and have a harder time eliminating drugs from the body. As they acquire more medical conditions, they get started on more medications and are at risk for additive side effects and drug interactions. Sometimes, side effects of drugs go unrecognized and new drugs are started to treat the side effects. Side effects can contribute to many problems we see in older people, like falls and confusion. When the risks of medication use start to outweigh the benefits, we call this problem polypharmacy. Polypharmacy is especially problematic for older people who are frail. This brings us to the concept of deprescribing. This term was coined in 2003 to help highlight its importance in the overall prescribing approach. We define deprescribing as the planned and supervised process of dose reduction or stopping of medication that may be causing harm or no longer be providing benefit. In other words, reducing medication safely to meet life's changes. The goal of deprescribing is to reduce medication burden and harm while maintaining or improving quality of life. But reducing doses or stopping medications can be difficult. Sometimes the original reason for the medication is unknown, especially if it was prescribed many years ago or by a different prescriber or in a hospital. Sometimes prescribers are worried about what might happen if they stop a drug. They're not sure if a drug can be stopped abruptly or needs to have the dose lowered slowly. And many disease guidelines recommend adding drugs, but they don't address when or how to stop them. Our research team decided to help address this problem by rigorously developing evidence-based guidelines that help clinicians make decisions about when it's appropriate to reduce or stop medications and then how to do so safely. First, we surveyed family physicians, geriatricians, nurses, and pharmacists across Canada to find out what drug classes they needed to have guidelines for to help them deprescribe. We conducted scoping reviews of the literature to find out which of those high-priority drug classes had published studies comparing continuing versus reducing or stopping them. Then, we formed an interprofessional guideline development team for each drug class. Each guideline development team carefully identified the scope of their guideline, what medical conditions would be considered or excluded, and how would other treatment approaches for the condition be handled. Each team generated key clinical questions to explore for the guideline. These included considering the impact of deprescribing the medication in the targeted conditions, the harm of continuing the medications, patient or caregiver values and preferences regarding the medication, and cost of both continuing or deprescribing the medication. Essentially, we wanted each guideline to help answer questions about when a medication should be continued, reduced, or stopped, whether it would hurt a person to deprescribe, how to deprescribe safely and effectively, and what to monitor while deprescribing. Members of the teams conducted systematic reviews of the literature to rigorously evaluate the evidence for deprescribing. The plan was to provide healthcare providers with the evidence for deprescribing so they could consider it in the same way they considered evidence for prescribing. Each team used the GRADE approach to make recommendations about deprescribing. GRADE stands for the Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development, and Evaluation. It considers four factors in determining the strength of a recommendation. The quality of supporting evidence, certainty that the desirable benefits outweigh the undesirable harms, certainty or variability in values and preferences of individuals, 
and certainty about whether the medication or deprescribing the medication utilizes a wise use of resources. After developing the main recommendations about when it's appropriate to deprescribe the medication, each team used its clinical experience as well as information in the deprescribing studies to provide advice about how to safely deprescribe, when to reduce the dose slowly and how often, or when it was safe to just stop the drug. Clinical considerations for each guideline included documenting what factors warrant continued use, how can patients be engaged in the deprescribing process, how should tapering be approached, what should be monitored and how often, and how to manage recurring symptoms. Next, each guideline was reviewed by independent healthcare providers and then by organizations that might consider endorsing the guideline. All reviewers used a method called AGREE-2, which stands for the Appraisal of Guidelines for Research and Evaluation. This method allowed reviewers to evaluate the process of guideline development and the quality of the reporting. A full description of our deprescribing guidelines methods are published online in the journal PLOS One. To help healthcare providers use the recommendations outlined in the deprescribing guidelines, each team developed a two-page deprescribing algorithm for each of the guidelines. One side of the algorithm illustrates the deprescribing decisions, recommendations, monitoring, and management plans to carry out the process safely. It also includes the conditions for which deprescribing should not be considered using the guideline. On the other side of the algorithm, we've included information about the dosage availability for each medication in the targeted class, patient engagement strategies, information about the side effects of the drug class, and information about non-drug management of conditions to help reduce reliance on medications. In our research using these algorithms, healthcare providers have told us how useful they have been to aid decision making. Each of the currently available deprescribing algorithms can be found at deprescribing.org. Our future research will focus on how these guidelines and algorithms can be integrated into usual practice and the impact of using them on patient care. You can check in on the progress of our research at deprescribing.org and by following us on Twitter. In our next series of videos, I will show you how to use each of the deprescribing algorithms for different types of situations. The Deprescribing Guidelines Project was initially funded by the Government of Ontario through the Ontario Pharmacy Research Collaboration, with recent funding through the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. I'd like to thank our team of investigators and staff as well as those who contributed to developing and reviewing each of the deprescribing guidelines and algorithms included in this important initiative.